Well, thanks again for doing this. This is fun. Well, it's a great honor. Thank you for being here. Well, let's. Uh, I'm going to try to go through this chronologically. Uh, sure. Let's start at the beginning here here in Springfield. You're a Springfield native. Grew up here. Uh, yes. Understand. What's this? What's this town mean to you? Well, it, it really means just about everything to me. Uh, uh, we came here. The family came here in 1939. My parents were immigrants from Sweden, and. Uh, so I grew up here in the Springfield schools. I started in a one-room schoolhouse and uh, went to two of the, the local grade schools and then on to uh, Springfield High School. And everywhere uh, <clears throat> that I went, every place I was involved, uh, people helped me. And uh, I got into high school, uh, was a pretty good athlete, uh, and I was helped even further. Uh, and people started supporting me to go to the Naval Academy. Uh, important people, people who had the, the ability to provide some uh, strong recommendations. Mm -hmm. uh, went on to the University of Illinois for a, a year on a scholarship when uh, uh, the Naval Academy uh, appointment kind of got hung up. But uh, then was appointed uh, by uh, Congressman Peter Mack and uh, I got to the Naval Academy, which was uh, the best thing that could happen to me at, at that point. It was, a, it was a way to go forward, and uh, it was a way to be somebody. When, when did you get interested in the Navy to begin with? I, I, th I think it was because I liked the Army-Navy football games. <laughs> I would listen to those, those games in the late 40s, and they were great games. It's when Army had their, their their, their big team, and Navy was really not much of anything at all, except those games were very close. And somehow the, the, uh, the fight of the Navy team was something that I picked up as uh, something I wanted to be involved with. It. And, and uh, the Academy sent one of their midshipmen here, who was, <clears throat> and I've forgotten his name, I'm sorry. Uh, but they sent him here to interview me, talk to me about why don't you try to go to the Naval Academy. And uh, the academy couldn't direct, uh, contact you directly. It was against the rules. But they said, well, if you write this gentleman, Rip Miller, who was the Naval Academy's uh, athletic director, very famous uh, athletic director, one of the seven mules at the University of Notre Dame uh, back in the, the days of the Four Horsemen, I wrote him, and, and uh, he said, OK, we'll, we'll work with you. And they did, and uh, with the local people, and to get me that appointment. And, and of course, I looked at the brochures and other things, and I just saw that this was a special place to be at Naval Academy. Was there a, a, an instant, or you mentioned destroyers first. Yes. Uh, but I'm just curious where destroyers and your interest in submarines. Well, I. <clears throat> uh, in my day, you, you had to, in order to get to submarines, you had to go to the fleet first and qualify as what was called the officer of the deck. And uh, the destroyer was was the best surface ship assignment in my view because it was, uh, you know, a pretty active ship and that's, you, know, you learn a lot of real se seamanship on a destroyer. And so I went first to a destroyer. I spent three years on that ship. Did pretty well, ended up as a chief engineer, and the captain kept saying, no, you don't want to go to submarines. You want to stay in the surface Navy, and you're doing well. And uh, lo and behold, I got orders to, uh, and this was very unusual, to command a patrol craft escort. It was, it was an experimental patrol craft escort, rescue. All of those letters were in there, E-P-C-E-R. Uh, USS Marysville. It was a it was a, a ship. It was about a <clears throat> 180 feet long, about a thousand tons, and uh, it had uh, five officers and 60 men. And I was a lieutenant junior grade, and and that was quite an opportunity uh, to be the commander of a ship like that. And it looked to, to me, it looked like a battleship. I mean, my gosh, I, to, to control that ship uh, was a great challenge. Uh, 
So I went to that for about a year, and then it, it reached the point four years after I was out of the academy, and that was the limit before you could go into submarines, for you to get into submarines, and I put in my request for submarines. What was the appeal of submarines? Uh, <clears throat> their operations are unique. They're independent. The captain makes the decisions. He, yes, he gets his patrol orders, training, guidance, and all before you go, and then when you go, you do what you think is right. Try to carry out your mission. Uh, but uh, it's that independence, uh, that uh, kind of the last of the Corsairs concept. Uh, and, uh, and then, of course, the people in some ways were so extraordinary. All volunteers, all very, very bright. The only reason the enlisted men weren't officers was probably they hadn't been to college or hadn't been to college enough. And uh, but they were clearly as smart or smarter than you were. And uh, so it was a wonderful, very small, uh, close community. Now this, you would have come on board probably in the mid to late fifties with that. Came aboard. Uh, <clears throat> my first submarine, actually, I went to submarine school in 1959. I graduated from the academy in 54. Okay. Three years on a destroyer, a year on the, the Marysville, and then into training, submarine training, which was six months uh, at, in, in New London, submarine school. And so I got to my first submarine in uh, the uh, fall of 59. This is the height of the Cold War. Yeah, and it was really starting to build. That was really when it really started to build from a technological point of view in submarines. And, and that's the thing that's so interesting to me. Nuclear power, is, it was proved with Nautilus years before that. The nuclear ships are coming online. And yeah. uh, what, what did they do in terms of, uh, well, obviously submarines are, are stealthy. Yes. But this gave them almost a limitless uh, yes. operational capability. Absolutely, yes. The development of that time was, uh, was incredible. Uh, it, it's a great story in itself. Uh, there's been a couple of books written about it. And I, of course, I was involved with Radmo Rickover for so many years. I know a lot about what was in the background, or some what was in the background. And, uh, but you know, he physically, uh, mentally uh, intimidated <laughs> the Navy to build a nuclear submarine, the Nautilus. And of course it went to sea in 55 or so. Uh, he got <clears throat> Admiral Nimitz to support him. Without that support he'd never got it. Uh, which was just showed you the far-reaching uh, skill uh, process of uh, Admiral Nimitz. And, uh, who, was then, who became the Chief of Naval Operations after World War II. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and of course the submarine proved itself, went under the ice. Uh, you recall Sputnik occurred. We were all very concerned. We were behind technology with the Soviets. A lot of pressure on, hey, we need to get this submarine uh, developed as fast as possible. The under ice mission was really a response to Sputnik. You go back in the timing, and and the uh, involvement of Rickover and Nimitz and uh, President Eisenhower. Eisenhower wanted to go immediately under the ice, and Rickover said, "No, we're not quite ready." And that's a, a good story in itself. I, I could take up the, the whole time with it, uh, but uh, and then <coughs> uh, another great Navy uh, uh, Admiral Admiral Rayburn, Red Rayburn developed the, the submarine launch ballistic missile. And now this you're talking about between 1955 and 1960. You're not talking about a lot of time. And the, this, I'm sorry, this, this is a real game changer. Oh, incredible. And so in those five years, uh, uh, you went from Nautilus to a nuclear attack submarine, the Skipjack class, the fleet ballistic missile was designed. They cut 
the construction of the uh, skipjack class, put in a big uh, wedge, missile tube section, the missile was designed, tested, all came together, went to sea on its first patrol in 1960 as advertised. The most, in my view, uh, incredible achievement, technological achievement, and it put us clearly ahead. Here we had a fleet ballistic missile, submarine force, 16 missiles uh, at sea, all the, not all of them, half of them at sea all the time. Uh, in those days, it had an accuracy of about a mile, maybe a little bit less. But there they were. And that was the beginning of uh, the, the uh, strategic deterrence that uh, existed for all those years until the Soviet Union collapsed. It's, in my view, what won the Cold War. What did it offer the United States in terms of strategic capability that the Soviets didn't have at that time? Well, they, they, didn't, they hadn't developed that uh, capability. They did in the late 60s. They, they started with their own ballistic missile submarine program and missiles. And of course, that was their half of the, the deterrence. I mean, that, uh, and when I say, they, I realize there are other means of uh, delivering the missiles, but you know, the submarine delivery was always there, and you knew no matter what you did, it was going to come. Whether you silence the bombers or whether you silence the land based ballistic missiles, the submarine missiles were always going to come. And, uh, but the, so they, were, they worked very hard to develop it. Uh, their ships were not as good, they weren't as quiet, their missiles were not solid fuel uh, rockets, uh, they were liquid fuel, they certainly didn't have the reliability by a long shot. But it came about 10 years down the pike. So for, but right off the bat, we once, you know, in 1960, we just held, we held the aces. And, uh, and they knew that, and uh, I, I think you can find in reading about, say, the Cuban Missile Crisis, uh, where uh, <clears throat> uh, Khrushchev said, I always worried about the submarines. You know, when they were all thinking about starting a nuclear war, they said, I was always worried about those submarines. And uh, so it was a step forward, and it really uh, created a, a great defense for the United States. When did you get your first submarine command? I, I had only one, a uh, three-year command of, uh, in 1968, uh, the USS Plunger, a nuclear attack submarine. It was a sister ship to the Thresher, USS Thresher, which was lost. Uh, mo very modern uh, submarine in three years, and it was, that was a height of, uh, in my view, the Cold War, 68 to 71. Lots of nose-to-nose -nose operations with the Soviets around the world. Their submarines, their fleet ballistic missile submarines, their attack submarines, their intelligence surveillance and reconnaissance that we did uh, all along uh, uh, the Soviet areas. Uh, and, uh, and it was uh, the, the best submarine we could design at that time, although we had that unfortunate occurrence at the uh, Thresher. Plunger stayed in service for a long time, I read. Oh, yes. Plunger, uh, I went and I spoke at her decommissioning about 19, uh, I guess about 1991. Always, always a great ship. Uh, and uh, still today, the, many of those crew members stay together on the, on the internet. I, every once in a while, I get a, uh, an email from one of them. Whenever they do something good, they seem to want to tell me about it which makes him feel good. What was it, uh, for you personally and professionally, what was it like to be in command uh, of such an awesome weapon as that? <clears throat> well, it, it uh, you know, it was, it was almost overwhelming. You, you of course, had, I'd had a lot of experience, uh, recent experience. I came into submarines, as you know, a little late, but I had been the executive officer of the uh, nuclear attack submarine Snook, and we had uh, 
from uh, 64 to 66 with a, a lot of overseas operations, and that was that was very helpful to me. I I had been aboard a fleet ballistic missile submarine for a year, uh, so those were my two nuclear experiences. Uh, they ordered me back to Washington to be in the Bureau of Naval Personnel. I thought my career was ended or something. I thought I'd done something wrong. But I went back there to become the assistant program manager for nuclear power, which was mainly involved with uh, recruitment and selection of personnel. Uh, but, uh, you know, it is a, uh, there's a lot of training that goes in, as I say. Admiral Rickover provided a, a lot of training before you went to command of the submarine. You had to go spend about three or four months in his offices. And at the end of that, you had to take an eight-hour examination. And if you didn't pass it, you didn't go. And it was, frankly, the toughest examination I've ever taken. Uh, but you've got a, a ship with nuclear weapons, which is an awesome responsibility. Uh, a deep diving, you know, the Thresher class was built to dive to 1,300 feet. Uh, greater than 30 knots in speed in a nuclear reactor and you had about 100 men and 14 officers and uh, so you had to you had to know pretty much what was going on uh, in that ship uh, every aspect of its operations uh, the certainly the tactical side but also on the technical side did you have any close encounters with the Soviet subs? Well, of course, we all did at one time or another. Uh, and, I, you know, we've kept pretty much of that quiet. Uh, it's still classified. Uh, of course, that was our job was to, to trail uh, Soviet submarines. Uh, there's, a, there's a great unclassified story about how, and this was purposely unclassified here a few years back, <clears throat> for the uh, Smithsonian Institute for the museum where one of our submarines uh, trailed a Soviet submarine for some 60 days. And uh, so you can see that that would be a tremendously uh, stressful environment because you're, you're, uh, <clears throat> you're, you're in close contact. You don't want, to, want him to contact you. you uh, had to make the right move, but you, you did everything by passive sonar means. You didn't want to make any noises like active sonar would make if you uh, transmitted a pulse. And uh, so it was kind of like boxing with uh, blindfolds. And so you just kind of had to feel your way there and you used different geometric constructions using the, the bearings you were receiving from your sonar. And it was a tough environment. And, and as you may have read in the book, Hunt for Red October, which is another story with me and Tom Clancy, uh, the, uh, the Soviets, you know, they would respond uh, with the crazy Ivan, they called it, where they'd turn and run at you, hoping, I, I think, to collide with you in order to embarrass your program. So you, when they made those moves, when they sensed you might be there, you had to make the right move to counter it. Mm -hmm. So, uh, yeah, you could come very close. Of course, I love the movie and the book. But yeah. <laughs> uh, so you knew, you know Tom Clancy? Oh yeah, I was much involved with that. I was in the Pentagon as the Deputy Chief Naval Operations in the early 80s for submarines. And my people came in and said, Admiral, you gotta look at this. There was the book. <clears throat> printed by the Naval Institute Press, never ever referring to any of us. And they, there it was. And it, it talked about trailing submarines. Well, we were very careful in those years never ever to indicate that we had the capability to trail a Soviet submarine. I mean, that was just even, never talked to in anything. And, and really, including the media, the, everyone followed that. And uh, you never heard of that. Now all of a sudden this guy writes a book about it. But the other part of it, of course, was, you know, the story. But the story that 
you could trail those submarines uh, was something. And he uh, and then he talked in there about the crazy Ivan and other things. <clears throat> so I went in to see my boss, who was now the chief of naval operations, uh, Jim Watkins, who just passed away last week. Uh, a great, great naval leader. Uh, so I went in and said, Admiral, you know, you've got to look at this. And he looked at it and he says, my God, how did you let that happen? I said, I don't know. Nobody ever told us anything about it. Uh, so I went back to my office and I said, i got to find out just what the background of this is. So I, I contacted Tom Clancy. He was an insurance man south of uh, Annapolis in Maryland. And uh, he came. I had lunch in my office with him and uh, talked to him and I said, now wh where did you get all this information? <clears throat> and he said, uh, and this is the first time I ever heard this term, I think he invented the term that the whole world uses today. He said, well all I did Admiral, was connect the dots. He said, I went to everything that exists in submarines and your testimonies and other things, and I ferreted all this out. And well, and at that time I thought I can't quite be right. Some of the stuff like the crazy Ivan he got out of somebody's mouth. Mm -hmm. Of course, he was down there uh, in southern Maryland, and we had nuclear power plants being built in those areas, and ex crewmen there, and I'm sure he wouldn't hesitate to buy a few, few beers <coughs> to uh, learn some things. Uh, well, we started there. Uh, of course, uh, Reagan read the book, loved it, and uh, of course that was, and he had him to launch it. But Tom and I became good friends. And subsequent to that, later on, when I was president of uh, Valley Forge Military Academy, he came up and talked to the students. He, a great uh, uh, American uh, supports a lot of things that people don't know. Probably the smartest man I've ever met. Uh, he has incredible memory, and uh, he, uh, uh, you know, started there. And, and of course, I raised a little hell with him about you know you these kinds of things you've got to check with us, uh, talk with us about. So the next book he wrote, which was uh, Red Storm Rising, mm -hmm. uh, he sent me the draft, which is six inches thick. Yeah. He said, okay, how about looking at it and tell me what I ought to take out of here? <laughs> I, uh, I, uh, I wrote him back, I said, you know, I'm not, this talks about the Army, the Air Force, but everything that goes on in the military, I can't take on that responsibility. Yeah. I said, do whatever you want, and just leave me, leave me and my submarines out of it. <laughs> Well, it's interesting to know that, oh my God, he really is that accurate. Oh yeah. I, I, one great story about him after I'd retired, he invited me to his now mansion down in Southern Maryland. Funny place. Uh, you go up to these big iron gates and uh, you talk into a box and the gates open and you're driving up the hill and, <clears throat> and you see a warning sign, typical highway warning sign that says, Caution, tank crossing. And you, you drive up over the hill and you look and there's a tank. <laughs> He's got stationed there. It wouldn't surprise you. He, uh, but he, he showed me during that visit, uh, and I was there, we were there supporting him. He was trying to, to buy a National Football League team. And he had a production, TV production crew there and all. And uh, he showed me the memo that he had sent to the... Uh, British Minister of Defense telling him how he thought uh, the U.S. would respond in the first uh, Iraq war in a very detailed four or five memorandum, four or five page memorandum, which was quite accurate. Hmm. The guy, you're right, very accurate. I also read that you inadvertently perhaps uh, ended up helping Robert Ballard find the Titanic? Oh yes, well it's, it, uh, it's a good story too. I, 
course, Thresher had gone down in 63. Scorpion went down in 1968. Uh, we knew where they were. Uh, we had not made a detailed examination of the bottom. We did, we did as much as we knew how to do. Uh, one of my <coughs> goals in the Pentagon was to, was to look into that further, especially the Scorpion, because we didn't know why we lost the Scorpion. We pretty much knew why we lost Thresher, which was a, probably a seawater system failure. And uh, so I put together a program to go out and examine uh, those sites. We had spectacular cameras in those days that had been invented. Uh, brought in young then Bob Ballard from Woods Hole, who was developing all this technology and uh, said we wanted to do this. And he said, well, you know, very enthusiastic, enthusiastic young man, far ahead thinker about other things in the ocean. <clears throat> of course, a, a great marine scientist. And uh, he said, you know, what, what, one of the things I've always wanted to do, Admiral, was to find the Titanic. He said, now, if you would permit me, during this operation, I could spend some of that time searching for the Titanic. And I said, absolutely not. I said, my God, I said, this, this is a serious operation we're involved with. It's top secret. And it, it needs to be done properly. And, a, and I could never convince anybody that we would have some sort of a cockamamie search for the Titanic associated with these uh, <clears throat> operations involving Thresher and Scorpion. So uh, we went back and forth with that. And I finally got a, kind of grew tired of the discussion. And I said, look, I don't care what you do, but you've got to do what I want done, and you've got to do it for the price that I'm willing to pay you. And uh, if you've got some time left over, if you want to look for her, you can do that. At the time, thinking he'll never find the Titanic. <laughs> so I'm, <clears throat> I'm in my office one day. Of course, that that, that was about 1982, 83. We, he looked at Thresher first. He did the Thresher site. Following a year, he went out to look at the uh, Scorpion. Did a good job with both of them. Uh, but on the Scorpion <clears throat> search or uh, operation, uh, he called. We got a call back, and my aide came in. He said, Bob Ballard's on the phone. <clears throat> so I got on the phone with him, and he said, I, Admiral, I can't, I can't tell you very much because this is not a covered phone. He said, but I want you to know we found it. And I said, you found what? I mean, you know, we knew where the scorpion was. <clears throat> he said, I can't tell you anymore, but... They want you to meet us in Portsmouth with the press to make the announcement. And hung up, and I thought, my God, we found the Titanic. <laughs> so I went up to see my boss again, old Jim Watkins, who you know I'd known some, for so many years. I'd been his exec on the, on the Stuck years before. And I said, Admiral, I've got good news and bad news. He said, what's the good news? I said, we found the Titanic. He said, oh, my God, that's incredible. What's the bad news? I said, we don't have a program authorization to go search for the Titanic, and I'm afraid the Congressional Intelligence Committees will be really upset with this. We <clears throat> went out on top secret operations and included uh, a Titanic search, uh, something that they would never, I think, approve. He said, well, you better go tell the Secretary of the Navy. Uh, John Lehman, wonderful Secretary of the Navy, you know, really built the Navy up, uh, enthusiastic young fellow, smart. <clears throat> and uh, so I went in there and uh, I said, Mr. Secretary, I've got good news. He said, what is it? I said, we found the Titanic. He said, oh, that's wonderful. He kind of jumped up behind his desk, as I recall. And I said, on top of that, and of course, Lehman was a great politician. I said, on top of that, they want you to meet him in Portsmouth in order to make the announcement. 
He said, well, of course I'll do that. Well, then I slid out of that room before he ever said, you know, what the, the next question was, well, what were you doing looking for the Titanic? <laughs> and, of course, he informed that President Reagan. Reagan was very pleased with it, so nobody ever took us to task. It was, so it was an unauthorized uh, program that uh, produced uh, the finding. That was kept secret until uh, the, my, my, the part of it about the decision-making process was kept secret until the 90s. And then the uh, National Geographic had me come back, and they did a program here about a five or eight years ago. Uh, See, I didn't know it had anything to do with Thresher and Scorpion. Oh, yeah. I had I, no idea. If you, if, you, if you get up on the Internet and you can see uh, there's a couple of programs about it that have a similar name, but the one that uh, National Geographic did, which was very good. Matter of fact, they had somebody playing me, uh, which was unusual. Uh, Titanic, The Final Secret. So if you get up and look through it, it's, it's up there. Well, it was funny. I was going through your career and, you know, doing the typical Google search and stuff. I'm like, Titanic? Really? <laughs> and I'm like, I had no idea. So I'm, I'm going to have to ask him about this. Um, you were chief of naval operations for submarines? What? De deputy chief of deputy naval chief. Mm -hmm. what, what was that period, Ron? When was that? Well, that was a long time. It was almost five years. From 1981, I came in uh, same time Reagan came in and uh, left in 85. Uh, so, uh, you know, through the entire Reagan buildup, you know, when I came in, I, I remember sitting at my, and I, I, I had been commander of Submarine Force Pacific, uh, as a young guy. Rick Over uh, was leaving. I had been fairly close to Rick Over. Uh, I'd worked for him directly. Uh, so I, I'm sure he uh, helped that quite a bit. So there I was in the Pentagon uh, as the Deputy Chief of Naval Operations, not experienced at all in the Pentagon. I'd been in the Bureau of Naval Personnel, had no Pentagon experience, and really <clears throat> didn't know exactly what I would do next. Of course, I was responsible for all submarine programs, and some $18 billion worth of expenditures. And, uh, and I went to my first uh, <clears throat> CNO executive board, and they talked about shipbuilding, and they didn't, they hardly said anything about submarine building. I remember I asked the question, well, shouldn't we be building more submarines this year? Well, we don't know. We'll have to take a look at it. Maybe we, we'll build one or two. Well, that's where it started. Five years later, I left the Pentagon. We were building five nuclear attack submarines and one fleet ballistic missile submarine every year. It was a tremendous buildup. And really uh, sponsored by uh, President Reagan and John Lehman and uh, of course Jim Watkins, Admiral Watkins was a submariner. And uh, this is really what put the pressure on the Soviets, that uh, this force was, was uh, an unstoppable force. And of course when the, the threat uh, came for the strategic uh, the SDI program, when that came and the Soviets saw that and they saw the tremendous buildup, they realized that we, we were in the driver's seat. And, uh, and of course, it, in my view, uh, that was a key to breaking the back of the Soviet Union. They couldn't deal with it. It's funny, I've had conversations with people who were in Reagan's cabinet at that time. Uh, another Illinoisan, Jean Kirkpatrick. Oh, yeah, I know her, yes. And, and, and uh, I said, so did you see this coming? Did you see the fall of the Berlin Wall? She said, no, and if anybody tells you they did, yeah. they're, they're crazy. But she said, we didn't know that we were being as effective as we were. The, uh, the great story, Jean Kirkpatrick's great story, she told it to me in, in the 90s when she came up to Valley Forge. And, and she's written this story in her books about uh, Keflavik, about uh, when uh, uh, Reagan was dealing with Gorbachev 
and uh, Gorbachev said, "Okay, well, we're 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 happy to uh, to modify the nuclear arms limitation treaty. Uh, we'll we'll go along with what you want, and uh, we want you, of course, to give up this SDI program." And uh, of course, this is what Jean told me. Uh, she, Reagan said, "Stopped the conference." He said, "The conference is over." Got up, walked out. And Gene Kirkpatrick said, I was running after him, saying, Mr. President, I mean, what's wrong? What's the problem? And he turned to her and said, we've won. Mm -hmm. uh, and he said, don't you realize that they wouldn't do that if they weren't, didn't think that uh, uh, they couldn't stop us? And it's a great story. And, and of course, I, I don't know where that was in relation to the timing that she talked to you about, but. Uh, uh, he had. He was the one who saw it yeah. with that event, uh, and of course he had. He had. He had put together this force and completely overwhelmed them without firing a shot, and that was. He meant to do that from the beginning, and I saw that in '81. I mean, when it, it, all of a sudden all of this money came in the submarines. And and today, you know the people, the senior people who were there and had an idea of what was going on can, can appreciate that. But to those of us who grew up under the threat of nuclear yes. war and everything, to almost instantly have that threat removed from the world yeah. scene, you know, we owe him a lot. Oh, uh, yeah, absolutely. It, it was, and it was so well done uh, without, excuse me, I need a little sip of water here. They, uh, they were developing the SDI <clears throat> at all the major laboratories in the country. I remember I flew over Sandia. I, was, I went out to Sandia. But as we flew over, there was this giant field of capacitors. Capacitors the size of a person or bigger, all, you know, like a huge graveyard. All putting together the electrical charge necessary to develop the weapon that would go along with SDI. I remember flying over that and I thought, my God, I mean, look at that. And I thought, the Soviets must fly over that every day with their satellites. And they're looking down and saying, my heavens, they're going to do it. They're going to develop this uh, system that will counter their ballistic missiles. Uh, and so it was well done. Now at the time, it was, from what I could tell, we were still had a long way to go. <laughs> but nobody else knew that. Uh, hmm. I, knew, I knew one of the Army generals who was a, in, in charge of that. I went to church with him for a while. Mm -hmm. Eventually became an Episcopal priest in his retirement. Uh. Interesting. Um, now after being deputy commander, or deputy Deputy Chief of Deputy Naval Chief. Operations. Uh, how does how does the Sea Wolf uh, development come out of that? Well, it was a good ship. It, as I say, today's fleet or the, today's combat commanders used to be called sinks. Say that, that they wish we had built more because this would have been the ship as we envisioned the ship of the 21st century. This would have been the ship to go into uh, the Far East today. Uh, go wherever it wants and uh, threaten uh, the Chinese uh, if necessary in order to uh, maintain uh, the, the current situation without war. It's a great ship. I, I uh, about five or six years ago, I, uh, maybe a little bit more, I got a call from uh, a four-star admiral <clears throat> who in my day was a young commander he and his, and, and, and his friend, who was a young commander, was also a four-star admiral, two of them. They called me and said, Admiral, wouldn't you like to go to sea on, the, on one of the SSN-21s? They just built the, the last one. I said, oh, I'd like it very much. Uh, of course, they knew I'd been so much involved with its development. And I called my, my heart doctor. I have a pacemaker. I said, what do you think? You know, there's big electrical. Uh, turbine generators and a lot of electromagnetics uh, running around. He said, "He said, well, and I said, I'd really like to go. He said, why don't you go and we'll fix it if, if something happens. <laughs> so, 
So I went to sea on it. It was a magnificent ship. It did everything that we designed it to do. I, one example, I think we, the quietest ship in the world at that point, and I think the fastest. I think it's probably still the fastest. And uh, probably still the quietest. Uh, but one of the things I wanted done in that was that well, you could fire torpedoes without making any noise. Well, normally that's a very noisy operation where you uh, open the doors and you pulse air into the torpedo tube with water and the torpedo goes out, but that's a lot, big noise. And we had to design a, a special pump that everybody said could never be designed. So I'm up in the torpedo room with the captain and these two admirals, and I said, I want to hear these torpedo tubes operate. I want to see what you got after it's all over. So we're standing there talking. I turned to the captain. I said, well, you know, when are you going to shoot the torpedo tube? He said, we already did. <laughs> and I said, I didn't hear anything. He said, that's right. <laughs> so it's, uh, it did everything. You know, that conceptual design, the single sheet characteristics. And you'll, you'll find arguments. Uh, Norman Polmar will argue with me on it, who he and I have kind of argued uh, over the years about submarines. He's a good friend. But we've always been a little bit at loggerheads. We'll say, well, it didn't do all the things. Yes, it did. And I think today we wish we'd, we'd keep building them because it, the three of them, our capital ships of the Navy. I, when I said the battleship of the Navy, I said it wrong. Where I got in trouble was I would call them the capital ship of the Navy. And that didn't go over well. <laughs> we, you know, we talked about this before we started rolling here, but uh, we didn't get it in the interview. Uh, what sets the uh, SSN-21s apart from anything that's out there? for the viewers watching this? What's, what's well, it's heavily armed, 50 torpedo uh, stowage spaces or, or cruise missile storage spaces, you know, twice as many, twice as many tubes, fastest ship, uh, as I said, just about in the world, the quietest. Uh, it, uh, certainly capable with this nuclear power plant of going anywhere and being there a long, long while. It, it can threaten not only the sea, and, and for many years I've believed, uh, anyway, that we, 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 the submarine force, control the sea, uh, but it can also threaten targets ashore now with the Tomahawk cruise missile and the follow-on missiles. Uh, it is the ideal weapon for the combatant commander. It gives him a lot of flexibility. And... Uh, the, uh, one of the things I said to you earlier, and I've, I've always firmly believed about the submarine, and it's certainly true of this submarine, you know, you can build a cruiser, and you get a cruiser, good cruiser. Uh, you build a submarine, and you build a navy. And uh, nobody knows where the submarine is, and it does know it has great capability, and, and it, could be, it could be there and threaten you. Land or, or, or at sea. As we come to the end of, of this, yeah. Ron, what would you say was your, was your greatest professional accomplishment? Or what's given you the greatest satisfaction? Well, my command, submarine command tour, was great, great experience. Three years, uh, a lot of time at sea. I think in 1970 we spent uh, 300 days at sea involved with some very exciting operations uh, that all turned out okay. There were a few moments of, uh, of uh, concern that they might turn out okay, uh, but it was that submarine command tour. And uh, you know, you were, as I said earlier, you were that Corsair, you went off and you did your thing and uh, you <clears throat> tried to get, do what your superiors wanted, but you always ended up doing a lot more or a lot differently than they expected. Uh, so that has got to be uh, my number one event. And I, and I would go back, if I had to put down a number two, I would say graduating from the Naval Academy. Uh, after the Navy, you were uh, involved with 
Valley Forge Military Academy? <clears throat> yes, I became the president at Valley Forge Military Academy there for th three plus years. I started having a lot of back problems. Uh, as I said to you earlier, I said I'd, two weeks ago I had my fourth back operation, so it's something that has been going on for some time. I'd, what it proved was that I was too tall for submarines, but I learned that too late. <laughs> but uh, now today you're still active, you're still doing stuff? Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, it was a local company, a small company, uh, EVT Global Incorporated. Uh, and we uh, design and build unique motors. You think we know everything there is to know about motor design? Well, we don't. There's a, a local inventor in uh, Fairbury, Illinois, uh, Norman Rittenhouse, quite an inventor who's invented a, a unique uh, motor, uh, permanent magnet motor that can operate at very high torque and at low speed. Uh, so uh, we're developing that and now starting to provide it for the Navy and in the swimmer delivery vehicles for the SEALs. We're operating with the SEALs and others and, and also with the, the commercial industry uh, for mining trucks and major trucking uh, installations. It's been a lot of fun. It's a small visit business, a lot of satisfaction because uh, We've got a concept that works, and now you've got to sell it. It's kind of like the SSN 21, and you've got to sell it to a lot of people to get support. We've gotten that support. We're starting to build on it. So it's kind of a, a great way to go, although it's certainly nothing magnificent uh, that might be published in the Wall Street Journal. <laughs> Still get con still get consulted by the Navy on things. Uh, the uh, and all of us go back uh, periodically and uh, talk to the uh, the various uh, commanders. The uh, the head the <coughs> commander submarine force uh, who is in uh, uh, Norfolk uh, has us back uh, periodically to to tell us what's going on, clears us and tells us what's going on and gets, gets our comments, which I think is a great idea. Because, uh, you know, we'll look at him and say, you're doing what? <laughs> you, you, uh, one of the things in, in submarines that I found over the years is that you, you need to do a lot of <clears throat> historical research. I started back, you know, the first USS Plunger was the first active duty submarine in the Navy, the SS-1. Uh, Teddy Roosevelt went to sea on it. He, uh, he was so excited about it that he authorized submarine pay. It was a, it was a gasoline powered submarine. They used to talk about how the submarines would be going up and down and up and down off the, uh, new, in the New London area because uh, Roosevelt authorized submarine pay, a dollar a dive. So they would surface and dive and surface and dive. Uh, but you know, you go all the way back through those years, especially the developments by the Germans, by our forces in World War II, great stories, wonderful heroes. <clears throat> and then as we went on uh, and developed the, the nuclear submarine, you, you, you relied an awful lot on that. I spent a lot of time when I was a submarine commander up in the classified libraries at uh, SUPPAC reading the patrol reports of our World War II submarines. I learned so much from that. And when I, and so uh, uh, I found that uh, that research is important if you're going to go ahead and develop something important for the future. I think we're at the end. Thank you so much. Okay, this my pleasure. It's thrilling. <laughs> it's wonderful. Thank you. Yes, sir. Appreciate Th it. Thank you for coming. Oh.